Welcome everyone, it's Michael Murray with Benzinga, joined today by the CEO of Longevron, Whale Hashad. Whale, it's great to have you with us. How are you doing? Very good, Michael. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure, Whale, and we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to speak with us. Give us a quick overview of Longevron and what the company does to kick things off. Yes, uh, Longevron is a cell-based therapy company. Uh, we have uh, our first product, uh, Loma Cell B, is in the clinic. Uh, we are studying it uh, to address three critical diseases that either have no therapeutic options today available or very limited therapeutic options. Uh, these are, uh, the first one is hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Uh, it's a congenital heart disease. Uh, the second one is Alzheimer's dementia. And the third one is aging frailty. So those are the three diseases that we are tackling and... Um, we're hoping to bring that medicine to all the patients they need it in the future. Wonderful. Now, Wael, tell us about Loma Cell B. How exactly does that work? So, you know, cell therapy doesn't have a very documented, but uh, the, the, the biggest uh, principle that we believe this product uh, work is through four main mechanisms. The first one is uh, through an anti-inflammatory effect uh, or having an anti-inflammatory cytokine effect. And then the second one is cell-to-cell -cell interaction. The third potential mechanism is exosome and microRNA release. And the fourth one is uh, mitochondrial transfer with the somatic cells that it try to help and support. Fantastic. Well, three new board members were elected to serve, including yourself. What do these board members bring to the table of Longevron? Yes, they, they really bring a great, um, uh, I would say, uh, overall guidance to the strategy and the governance of the organization. Uh, we have Koso Belouche, who is a very well-known executive. He comes with a very strong background from the pharmaceutical biotech, both in the U.S. and international markets. Um, he has been a CEO of a small company before as well. And he sits on multiple boards and, and, and he really uh, provides a great uh, perspective and, um, and wisdom to, to me, myself, as well as to the rest of the organization. We also have Jeffrey Pfeffer, who is a very well-known professor. He's very well published. He sat on multiple boards. He's a professor of organizational development at Stanford University, probably one of the most well-known and highly respected people in his field. And uh, Bo, he brings a, a very good um, background to the board, especially around um, how to have the organization function and achieve its goals and mission in the best possible way as well. Outstanding. Now, do these additions change anything in the strategic direction of the company overall? Yeah. So, the, you know, strategy is about making choices, uh, Michael, as you know. And uh, I think th there is, uh, I would say that since I joined, um, I've been trying to reprioritize some of the work that we're doing. I would say that my top priority right now is HLHS and for a very simple reason. It's potentially could be the fastest way to getting to the market and also the least uh, costly uh, alternative for us to get to the market. Um, Alzheimer and dementia potentially going to cost the company a significant amount of investment and probably the best way to do this is through a partnership with another major pharmaceutical or biotech firm. Once we have the results from our phase two, and hopefully it comes positive, our goal at that time will to find a suited partner that can uh, help us advance that program uh, forward. And then with aging and frailty uh, or aging frailty, uh, our focus right now is in Japan, and uh, we believe we can get there. And, and, and Japan provides a, an accelerated path uh, to getting into the market. So that's our top priority as well. So a little bit of just reprioritizing uh, where we spend our energy and focus. Um, that's uh, what I've done since I joined the company. Terrific. Now, a final question for you here, and actually two more questions leading into each other. Have there been any major shifts in how we approach aging in the last few years as a society? And what do we know now that we didn't know before in the past? Yeah. Well, um, aging is, is becoming more of a reality. Just to give you a, a little bit of uh, perspective, um, you know, the baby boomer um, uh, generation, their life expectancies were in the 70s, like in the mid 70s. Uh, generation X, their life expectancy is in the 85, 90 years old. And Generation Z, the newest uh, generation, is their... Um, 
life expectancy is expected to be on average uh, about at the age of 100. Uh, to put things in numbers, there was about 590,000 or more, slightly more, if, uh, people who are above the age of 100 in 2022. It is expected by year 2050, which is not that far, that this number will be eightfold more to about 3.7 million. So when you look at these numbers and, and people living to the age of 100, I think the, the most important question uh, question that comes is how can people not just live longer but live healthier and and live those uh, many years uh, in in a good health and good condition and and I think that's where our focus is is how can we help uh, making sure that uh, we bring medicines that can allow these patients have a better quality of life as they age and and reach those uh, triple numbers uh, that they are expected to reach in the future. Terrific. Now a final question as we close to, for someone in their early adulthood now, perhaps in the early 30s, what sort of healthy lifespan will be reasonable to expect? Will we see people regularly and healthily living to 100 plus in the future here? Absolutely, as I mentioned, uh, we're expecting uh, uh, this uh, people who are born today or, or an, an young adulthood today to live into their average life expectancy will be in the hundreds. Uh, um, so, as I mentioned, is um, you know any any anyone who is thirty today or born around the uh, turn of this century should expect to live to the turn of the other century, uh, twenty one hundred. So, yes, I think that's a reasonable expectation. And of course, everything I mentioned here is based on averages. Absolutely. Well, it's great insights that we've gotten as far as Longevron specifically, but also the industry that you're in and what we can expect to see in the future. Well, Hashad, CEO of Longevron, thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you very much, Michael, for having me.